Put this one up first, 1 Corinthians 1.19. No, it's, uh, sorry, it's 1 Corinthians, it's 15.19 through 22. I think I gave you that wrong. Let me read it, um, 1 Corinthians 15. Yes, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, that's Adam, and the resurrection of the dead comes through a man, for as in Adam all die, just leave it right there, and, and so in Christ all shall come alive. Just leave it there at that first one. You know, I've been so burdened for my city. I've been born and raised here in L.A., my children, my grandparents, uh, even some of my relatives I found out were in ministry here in churches back in the 20s. And uh, I think one of the biggest shocks to the human race is to find out that they're actually born into a fallen race. It's just, it's like the, res you know, it's like the, what can I say, the thing people need to know. Um, I was about 22 years old. I had had a severe uh, cut in my arm. I had gone, sold everything I had, 1970, late 71, decided to go to Hawaii to seek the truth. And uh, I had to come back to L.A. because uh, uh, to get some more money to go back, and I was planning on living in, in Hawaii again on Oahu, the North Shore. And um, anyway, I had a bad accident, m lived in, moved in with my grandparents down in Las Feliz area. And uh, I remember I was seeking the truth, and some people... Uh, I'm, this guy that I met uh, actually at the fountain there on Las Feliz, he had a big dog. I had a, even a bigger dog, and we got talking, and, and uh, he invited me to his religious church. So I went, and they were, uh, it was a gohanza, you know. You had to chant this gohanza. And, and uh, anyway, the next thing I knew, these precious people came over. We were living in what was called the Las Feliz Estates. It's still there. And they came and brought me this altar, and uh, you have to understand, I had not been in church. I, my, gr both grandparents were raised in uh, something that's not quite Christian, although some of them think they are. And um, so uh, I, I remember they had that in the room there on Los Adornos. And uh, I, I'm a young man just seeking, you know, not really knowing what's going on, but seeking, you know, the truth. And I hear this, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I woke up that morning, picked up that little altar, and threw it across the street. It was on a mountain. Then I realized, that's not far enough. So I went, up by the, um, I went up by the observatory, and I threw it down from the observatory, threw it down the cliff, and it was like, whoever that is, I'm not going to do that again, you know. And thou shalt have no other gods before me. And uh, he began to draw me. He had been drawing me more than that. But uh, he began to make it crystal clear to me that hell was real, and I was on my way. And I remember um, I had had a dream where I had seen the Lord about that time. Actually, it was uh, a, a little, about a year later. And, uh, uh, and I remember he, he uh, gave me this tremendous hunger. I had a vision of him in a dream at night. And then uh, the next semester at Cal State Northridge, they had a... a a class called the English Bible as Literature. And I, I got to get into that class. <laughs> Something's going on. I told my grandmother, I got to get into that class. I got into that class and I, I read it. And I remember the scriptures that said in uh, Matthew 5, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. And I remember walking into the, we had a barn in the back, had big property. And I walked in and I remember that verse came to me. I'm thinking, whoa, whoa. Wow, I'm not even going to get into heaven then. You know, and uh, anyway, over a period of time, uh, he began to reveal to me, are you ready? This was awesome, that the devil was real. Oh, yeah. Where did you see the devil? I saw darkness in my own eyes. That's what I saw. And uh, I, I realized, I I'm not going the way I'm supposed to. I don't really know where it is. And eventually, I went to work for my uncle, who at that time owned, uh, he was the first one to uh, um, import, at that time they called him Dotsons, and he had a dealership in Glendale and one in uh, Santa Barbara. I worked in the one in Glendale. I met this guy, real outgoing, 
evangelical, charismatic guy. And he started talking to me about Jesus. I go, yeah, man. I said, that's it. I said, I am so ripe, I'm going to fall off the tree. So he takes me up Beechwood off of uh, Franklin Avenue, up into the mountains there in a beautiful home. And some guy, Asian guy, Bill Yamamoto, never seen him since, 19, early 1976, he, he starts saying, there's a man here who's going in circles, and the Lord says, be still and know that I am God. And so he began to draw me. I go to church, you know, and two weeks later, my new wife, or, you know, my wife who we had just been married five months or four months, you know, we end up going to church, and, you know, Jesus Christ made himself crystal clear at the Valley Vineyard, the only vineyard in those days under Ken Gullickson. But um, I've had such a burden this week of how many people are like me. Um, you might know something's up. At least America's becoming aware of the fact that evil exists, right? That's tremendous. Do you realize that? That's, a, that's awesome. That liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, independents, they all believe that there's evil. And uh, that's exactly a way that people start to wake up. So I've had such a burden. So it says here, if only in this life, we'll just read it again, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most, uh, most pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of them who have fallen asleep. For since death came, now this is the big thing, death came through Adam. When Adam and Eve died, they didn't die spiritually. God actually allowed that death, the separation between man and God, that's what death is. It's separation between man and God. That's what the Hebrew means. They were separated. Therefore, Adam and Eve, they hid, you know, and uh, they knew something was wrong. They now saw they were naked. They were no longer covered with the glory of God. Those who have fallen asleep since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead, and that's what happens when we're born again, born from above. We are raised from the dead out of as it were, Colossians says, we are translated out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. This is just simply the gospel. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead came through a man. For as in Adam all die spiritually. They're disconnected from God. The Bible says there, our minds are at enmity. They're actually in rebellion against God. Uh, in Christ all uh, will be made alive. That's my biggest burden. I just want to take a moment just to pray for our loved ones. Some of you have loved ones. You know what I'm talking about. If they really, if the scripture says Jesus came to give recovery of sight to the blind, if he started giving recovery of sight to the blind in L.A., for example, or in any city, by midnight, this whole building would have been full of people and it wouldn't have been any of us. You know what I'm saying? Or they would go down to the Catholic church or wherever they could find a church if they're being awakened. He said in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. If he's going, not if, since he's going to do that, what do you think he's going to pour out his spirit on? You are lost. You are need to be drawn. You're a lamb that's, you know, that's lost, you know. He has to make that real. And he did it to me so dramatically over a period of about two or three years. But he began to draw me, and I pray, Lord, this is my prayer, Lord, you can say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, yes. you said you would pour out your Spirit on all flesh, that you would awaken the hearts of men, women and boys and girls, that they are lost and that they need a Redeemer. And Jesus is the only way to heaven. to heaven. We believe this is true. We believe this is true. If, since it is, since it is. <laughs> make, it make it real to all of our friends, all of our, friends, all of our neighbors, all of our, neighbors, all of our loved ones, all, our loved ones, all the people I work with, people I work with. In, your in your holy name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Did I give you John 12, 31 and 32? I love this so much. I'll, I'll just quote it. It says, Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. But I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world, that's the devil, will be driven out. Driven out of what? Driven out of the hearts and minds of people. The powers of darkness that infiltrate the air, the atmosphere, filling us with anti-God things all day long. God says, now is the judgment's going to come 
on this world. Now is the prince of this world be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up, I will draw all, I will lift it up from the earth. I will draw all people to myself. That's a great verse to remember, that he would draw all your friends, relatives. Listen, hell is so much worse than anybody can possibly imagine. Hell is for real, you know. I remember the stories, you probably heard it. Somebody went to church and the pastor was saying, you know, uh, you're going to go to hell if you don't know Jesus. And the guy said, what did you do? He said, I got so mad at that guy, I just walked out of the church. I'll never go to church again. And he saw the guy a few months later and he says, did I hear you became a Christian? He says, actually, yes. Well, what happened? He goes, I don't know. I, I, I went to another church and the pastor was talking about going to hell, but he said it with tears. They're all, you know, you're mad as a Christian. On the one hand, if you say people are going to hell, then you're an idiot or you're a bigot or you're a religious idiot. But if you don't, who will? So you see that it has to be the Holy Spirit, friends. God has to begin to invade us as a people, as a nation. Our nation's gone, in my lifetime, it's gone exactly the opposite direction of God. But uh, here it says... Now is the judgment of this world. Put up um, Isaiah 14. I want to give you a general biblical understanding of the condition of humanity and those who believe in the Lord. This is a prophecy um, about Satan, who is Lucifer, who was the morning star. It says, how have you fallen um, from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth. And that's exactly what happened. We have other verses that say that Satan, when he rebelled against God, approximately one-third of the angels went with him. That's in Revelation 12. It's the only verse we have, but uh, everybody agrees that that's how it happened. You have some in the Old, some of the New Testament that tell us these things. It says, how have you fallen um, from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low nations. You have said in your heart, this is where Satan got in trouble. You have said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. Let's go. Next one. And I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Um, not a good idea. You understand? Uh, I, I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly and on the utmost heights of Mount Zion. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Wrong. But this is Satan. This is what he does. And that's what we have today. People are making themselves like the Most High, believing in humanism, that we're, we are the center of the whole universe. It's Satan's religion, and it's, for the most part, America's religion. And even pastors, Christian pastors, play into that and make self and our life at this time, the highest priority. They're missing it by a mile. Is that the end of it? Okay, good. I want to um, give you a few other verses here. In, um, let me explain that one a little bit first, then we'll go to Ephesians 2. But here we see the rebellion that came in heaven and how Satan was cast to earth. The scripture says that he made himself into a snake. He told Adam and Eve, you can be like God. That's what he said about himself. He was thrown to heaven to say that, but he was putting that on, and uh, the scripture says, no, you don't. So here is the state of man, Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1 through 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Jesus said in John, I think it's around 8, 12, it says, if you do not believe that I am he, uh, for I told you I've come from above, if you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. For as you were dead in your transgressions and sins and what you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world, that's the cosmos, the thinking of this age, uh, and the ruler of what? The ruler of darkness or the ruler in this translation, that this is the new NIV, the ruler of the kingdom of the atmosphere or the air, okay? So who's ruling the atmosphere? Who's filling everybody, whether it's universities, whether it's media, whether it's Hollywood, whether it's uh, false teachings, whatever? It's the ruler. Now watch this. Uh, yeah, this is so important. It's the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is what? It's a spirit who is now at work and those who are what? 
disobedient. So Satan has a great congregation today. He's evangelizing through rock and rollers. Obviously, some of them know the Lord, and it's, I'm not saying about everybody. He's evangelizing through anybody who is not proclaiming the gospel. He's evangelizing. Whether they think of themselves an evangelist or not, they are evangelizing under the power of the prince of the darkness of this world, and it's to those who are disobedient that is separated from God. All of us, all of us also lived among them at one time. That's who we were. What is it like gratifying the cravings of the flesh or what's called the fallen nature and following its desires and thoughts like the rest we were by what? Here it comes. By nature deserving of wrath. Actually, the Hebrew or the Greek actually says we are by nature the children of wrath. So this is where you see... It's not only becoming like, well, I believe in Jesus or, you know, I'm this or I'm that or I believe in all religions. No, the scripture is incredibly clear. The Bible is so clear. It says you must be born from above a second time and you must then have a new nature put in you because the nature that you were given through your sweet mommy and daddy, just like you and me, we were by nature uh, deserving wrath. But the actual, it says we are by nature the children of wrath because our nature is at enmity with God. That's why Jesus said, pick up your BMW and follow me. <laughs> drive a BMW. I think they're awesome. Drive a, anything you drive. But you know, the gospel is still the cross. And what an offense it is. The offense of the cross. Well, you know, I, it was such a hard time talking to my father over the last several years of his life, 20 years. My brother and sister both know the Lord. We were praying for him as well as Pam and the kids and stuff. But he always had such a hard time about sin, you know, until the end. And then, you know, it's just like dad, you know. And he goes, yes, I. And then his mother, Christian science mother, who later became uh, through uh, m my tapes and stuff, she became converted and was saved. But um, she uh, uh, taught him the Lord's Prayer and Psalm 23. In his last days, he would just recite the Lord's Prayer and Psalm 23. I said, Dad, that's it. And then my wife got the most awesome verse for my dad, for her dad, actually. And it's Ecclesiastes 7.1. And my dad loved that verse. I said, Dad, the day of your death will be greater than the day of your birth. He goes, I like that. I go, it's awesome, Dad. You're going to die in a few days. It's going to be awesome. You know, it's going to be the best day that you've ever had. And it's true when you're born again. So it's a chilling thing to me. I've been really um, feeling the weight of it in my city where I live and the things that are going on in our nation. Old conviction of sin seems to have lifted and uh, having a good time in Jesus seems to have taken center stage. I believe in having a good time. But this morning, even in the prayer time, a weight of the presence of God came. And there are those beautiful songs that we sang about the Lamb of God. It set the stage. And I said, told Pam, we cannot do announcements. We can't do anything. We just have to proclaim his simple word. So I want you to go now, if you would, to um, uh, John 1.29. You know, when Jesus came upon the scene, John the Baptist, who was the one who would prepare his way, he comes on the scene and it says, next day John saw Jesus coming unto him and said, boy, are we having a good day here, right? He said something that was so revelatory, friends, because as a Jewish man, as an Israeli, he, he got a revelation that this is the sacrifice that's going to take care of it all. So he says... Behold, or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the what? Sin. sin of the whole world. It's amazing. When Jesus died, seemingly, we're not exactly sure the first words, but probably with Mary, he uses this word, chero, which means everyone rejoice. When Mary saw him, he said greetings to them, and it, it actually means everyone rejoice. Why? Because I did it. I broke the power of sin over all humanity. John 3.16, let's put that up. It, these verses mean more to me at this time. But John 3.16, they say it's the most famous verse in the scriptures. Well, here, there's two parts to it, good news and bad news. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall what? 
What about those who don't believe in him? They'll perish. That's why I said the biggest revelation for me as a young man being drawn to the Lord, hell is real, the devil's real, and you're not going to heaven the way you're living. That's exactly what happened. It was not, it, there were a few people who witnessed to me over a period of time, but it was actually the scriptures specifically, and then a verse I didn't even know I knew when I had a Gohanza in my house. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's like, all I knew was, man, I had to get that thing out of there. You understand? It, what, what was your neighbor down the street talking? No, bro, I'm telling you, man, this was the Holy Spirit, dude. And it totally freaked me out. That's all I can say. I had to get rid of that thing, get rid of it fast. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21. These are such beautiful verses. For we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you. See, Paul was so strong, imploring them. Next verse, imploring them on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God, for God made him who had no sin to become sin, that in him we might, what? Become the righteousness of God. It's actually a verse that says that we are progressively coming in to partaking of the righteousness of Christ as we abide in him. Philippians 1, 9 through 11 says that we might grow in the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the biggest things that we need today is righteous people abiding in Jesus Christ, living in California, especially in our neighborhoods, because where there's righteousness, it keeps away the wrath and the judgments of God, or at least it protects it. If there's enough salt and light in your neighborhood and my neighborhood, then you're in the ark of God, so to speak. You get me? But let alone for us living individually as Psalm 91 Christians. But the bottom line is this. We can become the righteous of God because God made him who knew no sin to become sin. We'll look at these verses now. Let's go to um, Matthew 26, 26 through 30. Um, it says in Romans, I, I want to read, I'll just read Romans 3 to you because I want you to get this. If you're ever taking notes or, or you know, something to really hopefully establish you in these truths, it'll be helpful. But it says in Romans 3, 25, let me just read this for you. It says, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of an atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in, the for, in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand from Adam all the way up until Jesus. He had left them unpunished. No one had to suffer the wrath of God. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. He explains how Jesus is the Lamb of God who came and God was waiting. He left the sins of Adam and the sins of mankind for the most part unpunished un until Jesus could come. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, which uh, he then took a cup and then and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We're going to receive communion today. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's go now to 36 through 39, 26, 36 through 39. When Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. I wanted you to see that. He, you know, told them, look, I'm going to go to the cross. You know, they didn't understand it. He had to rebuke Peter. Then he says, here, the Holy Spirit testifies through him. My, my soul is so overwhelmed, I could die. The scripture says that he, in other verses, was sweating drops of blood. They say under very, very, very intense pain, your capillaries break. 
and the heat, the pressure that he was under, he not only had sweat, but it was mingled with blood. At that point, his heart is being fully, totally overwhelmed with what's going to happen to him. He's going to taste, taste the wrath of God for every single one of you. It's things like this that we need to literally allow to find a place inside of our heart so that we would live reverently before the Lord. We have such an easy gospel today. Jesus just wants to make your life better. Yes, he does, but he's going to, it's going to cost you because he wants to replace your old nature with your new, and he wants you to grow up in him. And he said, pick up the cross. The transforming power of God is in the cross, and the love of God, and the life of the Holy Spirit flowing into you. All these things work together to transform you and I. That's what we're looking for. In heaven, you will be in outer court, inner court, or the holiest place of all, in different le levels of heaven, all according, are you ready? By how much of Jesus Christ has been formed in you? Paul was so concerned about the Galatians. He says, my little children, I'm in travail again until Christ be formed in you. You're in seed state only. You're carnal and you're subject to witchcraft. You've been bewitched. You're following a false gospel. And so he lays out the gospel again. And he says, I'm in travail again until Christ be formed. The formation of Christ is when you start finding out there's an inward righteousness, there's an inward ability to forgive, there's an inward ability to love people, to see things, to desire, to hunger the word of God, to pray to God. That's all the formation of Christ. Now you know that Christ is formed in you. You are really starting on the road of discipleship and of true transformation. Once it's beyond just a seed. Oh, yes, I know Jesus. I love him. I think about him once in a while. When he's formed in you, there's an inner transformation that causes you to say no to things for a long time you couldn't say no or didn't even know you were supposed to say no to. The formation of Christ inside of you is how you become a holy man and woman of God. And in these coming days, we're going to be holy. We're going to be full of love. We're going to be fruitful. We're going to be filled with joy. And we're going to have the light of the world flow inside of us to help people see oh it's coming there's a there's a line of in the sand right now God is saying in the last days you'll pour a spirit upon all flesh and it's those of us who prepare ourselves pour out your spirit upon me Lord renew my mind I've got a bad attitude about my job I've got a bad attitude about my roommate or my spouse or one of my kids or I got a bad I got a bad attitude about you Lord I haven't been praising you I have a hardness in heart inside of me pour out your spirit upon me help me Jesus Save me again, Lord. It says in Romans 5.10, it's a great verse. Are you ready? It says, if we were saved by his death, how much more shall we be saved by his life? Oh, I've been saved by his death, all right, but I am being saved every day by his life, his righteousness, his mercy, his grace. Can we find Romans 5.10? But let's don't go there yet. My soul, I want you to see it. Some of your lights went on, so I thought I better show them this one. Yeah, they better find out that. They better look at that verse again. I'm cracking up here. I mean, my voice. Oh, not, okay. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, my God, if it's possible, let this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Let's go a little further here. 2745. This is just a progression through Calvary. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. That's not normal. That's a holy sign, right? From noon until afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Je Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Now, he is quoting Psalm 22. The Jews should have known this. They know the verses. Eloi, Eloi, it says, Lama Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's when Jesus tastes death for all men. At that moment, God the Father lifted. The angels are gone. No grace. You're going to suffer as the sin of this world. Remember, he made him that knew no sin to become sin. At that moment, he's cut off from God. He is totally given over to the powers of darkness. They're beating him. They've already mocked him. His mother's standing there. His disciples are there. He's been stripped naked. His beard has been pulled off. They are mocking him. And now God has forsaken him. You can imagine the apostles and his mother and all of them. They're just, 
I don't even know how Mary survived. You think she would have had a heart attack and just died on the spot. I mean, let alone the rest of the disciples. This is, friends, this is way beyond anything that even the passion showed. And thank God for Mel and making that movie and all the other things that are going on. But it's way beyond that, friends. When the Son of God says, I'm forsaken, it's dark. It's way beyond normal. So he says, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there uh, uh, heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, got a sponge. He filled it with vinegar and put it on his staff and offered to Jesus to drink it. They would give them these kinds of things to help numb the pain. And, uh, but the rest, uh, 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 and, and Jesus uh, offered it to Jesus. Uh, the rest said, now leave him alone. He, it says that he rejected it. I don't know why this new NIV didn't put it. In there. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to him and save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the temple. Now, I, I don't know exactly, but they say it was like, you know, 12 or 14 feet high, maybe 18. But it, they said it was 18 inches thick, and it was torn from the top to the bottom. What does that mean? That means somebody real tall broke it open. And it broke it open, and it says in... Hebrews, it says that we can now enter into the most holy place by a new and living way, by the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. So he was saying when his body was broken, the way to God was broken open. When, when he died on that cross, now you and I, you don't need a priest, you don't need your pastor to go before the living God, the Father, and you can stand there just like Hebrews 10, 19 says through 22. It says we can come to the, to the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, through his flesh that was broken, through him we can come before God, God Almighty, any one of you at any time, in your car, in your home, you can come before the living God if you have faith and you believe in him. Just know this, if you don't have enough faith, ask him for more. He'll give it to you. He's the source of your life. He is your righteousness. He's your peace. He's your savior. He'll help you. Amen. Yeah. So it says here, now watch this, it gets radical. Then Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. The earth shook, the rock split. Man, the tombs broke open. And this is so holy. The, and, the, and the what? The bodies of many what? Holy people who had died were raised to life. Can you imagine? Oh, I just saw Elijah. Honey, Esther's over here. What is going on? Life broke in. This is only said in this verse. This is one of the most amazing verses in all the Bible. Uh, well, you think God can never do it again? He can do that and everything else that's in the Bible he can do again. He can do anything he wants. You know, let Esther walk in here. Let, let King David come and lead worship next Sunday. It's fine with me. Amen. I'll have to tell Andre, but uh, I'll let Andre and Diana know. But if King David, if King David walks in next Sunday, he's going to lead worship, my friend. And don't say that they're dead. They're more alive than you and I. Oh, pastor, what are you talking about? I'm telling that if we can go to heaven, and it says that when you're born again, you're born from above, and you can be raised up to sit with him in the heavenly places. If we can go up, who are not as pure, and they've been purified with brand new, you know, totally free. If we can go up, they can certainly come down. They're not going to defile anything here. And they do come down, if you're aware. But on Mount Zion's where you'll meet them. That's where you can have a party. That's where the real homecoming party is. Or I should say, the family reunion is in Hebrews 12. Mount Zion, the city living God. They're all there. When you start arriving there, you'll know what I'm saying. They came from the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city, appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had what happened, uh, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. So even these guys are thinking, man, they might have been the first ones in the church as far as we know. You know, they might have been the first ones in the synagogue next Sunday saying, I'm not, it's not my day off, but I'm here. I saw him. Something's happening. God shook everybody up. Blessed be his name. Uh, was that down to 54? Let's go to Isaiah 52, 14 and 15. I'm just filling you with verses because you need them. I need them. They were given to me, so I'm giving you what I got. So not, watch this. About 3 o'clock in the morning, 1999, I'm in Switzerland. 
and I'm awake. I said, oh God, I don't do well <laughs> with jet lag. I've gone over 40 hours going to Africa. It's, oh God, and I'm supposed to preach in three hours, please help me. So I'm going through one of those things. And uh, he gives me this out of nowhere. He says, 62% of Iran will be saved. I'm going to appear to many of the Middle Eastern kings. And this is the verse he gave me. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So, really? He will sprinkle many nations and kings instantly showed me kings, house of Saud and others, showed me that he was going to make himself so crystal clear of who he is, and they would marvel as kings themselves that the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who he'll reveal himself to these guys, and he has to some degree already, they're going to be overwhelmed and open their nations to God. That's exactly right. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him for what they were not told. These are unreached peoples, my friends. These are Muslim nations, my friends, and others, other nations of other belief systems, Buddhism, whatever. For what they were not told, they will... Listen, friends, when he starts pouring... I want you to get this. When he starts pouring out his spirit upon all flesh, he's going after the kings of the earth. He's going to deal with those dudes one way or another. He's going to deal with those kings and queens. You know, if you know the story of the Argentine revival, man, he went after Perón, and his wife didn't go for it. He, they prophesied exactly how she would die, pulling out her hair and cursing God, and that's the way that woman died. She was in witchcraft. But Perón got healed instantly by Tommy Hicks and opened the whole nation up to him. We're coming into times, we're coming into the days of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, listen carefully, in the uh, 17th chapter of Luke, it says, in the day, he says, you will look, tells his disciples, in that day, starting around verse 20, he says, you will look for one of the days of the Son of Man. You will not see it, but it will be like in the sun, in the days of uh, Noah. And we're coming into the days of Noah much, Noah much faster than people realize. And the days of the Son of Man will also come back to the earth. It'll be as if Jesus Christ is walking among his people like we haven't seen, or I should say, like no one has ever seen except the early days of the apostles walking with the, excuse me, the Lamb of God while he was still on the earth. Read it yourself, Luke 20, or Luke 17. He will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him for what they were not told. We didn't know that. We didn't know Jesus was God. We didn't know he was the Savior of the world. They will see, and what they, uh, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Friends, that verse is coming to pass. God's going to start dealing with religious leaders all over the world. It's going to be amazing. I saw houses of prayer filled with mostly Muslim men. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. And very rich people, Persians and so forth, were multi, multi, multi millionaire people long time ago. Okay. All right. I'm going to give you a few more verses because you're begging me. Okay. <laughs> Acts 2.22. You need to have the Bible sometimes, the real thing. Fellow Israelites, this is Peter on the day of Pentecost. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you with miracles, signs, which God did among you. Through him, God did. The real sign of apostle, it says Peter was an apostle to the Jews. Paul said, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. For God who was at work in Peter as an apostle was also at work in me. Here he is in Jesus, working through him. God did among you. Uh, through him, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan. Amen. And foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to what? Hold, to keep its hold on him. Amen. So that's what he proclaimed. And remember, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, there were over 500 people that saw Jesus at once. And all these people who believed in Jesus of the 11, they were all martyred, believing that they had seen him, that he was the savior of the world. They weren't playing games. It was real serious. Let's look at Colossians 2.13 2, through 15. 
This shows you what else he did. He broke the power of sin, and he broke the power of the devil. Hallelujah. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision scission of your flesh, that's what we're saying. We were by nature the children of wrath, and now Jesus, according to verse 11 of that same chapter, Colossians 2.11, he cuts off the power of sinful flesh, and the Bible says, reckon yourself dead to it. And that's what he says here. Uh, you, uh, you, you know, he uh, uh, dead in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. You've been raised from the dead. He forgave you all your sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having, here it is, disarmed the powers of darkness and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Listen carefully. Okay, the powers of darkness are broken. However, they still have, like Egypt, they still have people under their dominion because men and women are subject to disobedience through their own fallen nature. Are you with me? Trying to paint a real clear picture here so that you can be a better witness to your friends and relatives so that you guys can become a part of a great salvation army. But you must know the truth. People are lost. People will say, had someone the other day tell me about something that they were, a script they were reading in Hollywood and all the people all liked it. It was really bad. And the guy says, you know, well, we're, we're, we're just drawn toward darkness. It's like, exactly. Can't help it. You're in the kingdom of darkness. But when God begins to shine his light, I was once blind, but now I see. Like that guy said, did, did he really heal you? You know, he knew he was going to get thrown out of the, uh, uh, of the church, the synagogue, you know. And he said, all I know is this. I was once blind, now I see. That's what's happening. Even myself, I'm beginning to see more and more clearly. But the gospel is holy. The gospel is ours and Jesus Christ and him alone. You know, it's so amazing. I think I'll close with this in Luke 16. In Luke 16, if you want the exact verses, it's 16, 19 through 26. And uh, it says that there was a, a rich man who was really doing well, and there was another guy named Lazarus who wasn't doing well. And uh, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and, and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing uh, to eat anything that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and uh, licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now that word they say is actually bosom, which means the intimate place with Abraham. That's where, listen, that's where David was. Jeremiah, all the faithful Old Testament saints. You see, the hell was in the center of the earth and there was a division. And on one side was Abraham and all of the faithful. And on the other side, you'll see this in this verse, only scripture in the Bible that makes it really clear like this. I want you to see this. So it says, they carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, which is the Greek word for hell. And there he was in torment. So it's hell, you see. He looked up and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham. I mean, he's a Jew, he's a believer. You know, it's like saying, hey, pastor, you know, or hey, you know, anybody, anybody over there. Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He was still used to that guy doing whatever he wanted him to do because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember, called him son, that you, in your lifetime, you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides this, between us and you, there is a great chasm and has been <clears throat> set in place so that those who want to come to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from here uh, to, to us. And uh, so you see here that before what happened was is Jesus went down there. He said, as Noah or as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, so shall the Son of Man, or as he was three days and three nights in the um, whale, he said, I will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. He went down there. Are you understand? What did he do down there? Well, how long he suffered agony, I don't know. Some people think the whole three days, I don't know. 
I don't know exactly. I know he was in agony. But when he went down there, I know that there were several things he did. He got the keys of death and hell, because he says that in Revelation 1. He absolutely grabbed in some way all the powers of darkness and marched them openly before the angels and demons, and he ridiculed them as it was in the days when Romans or others would take a nation. They would go in and usually cut off the thumbs of the, of the leaders and stuff and parade them through the streets and mocking them. You understand? So it says Jesus did something like that. That's why the powers of darkness tremble at his name. There's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. But it says that even the devils believe and tremble. They tremble because they saw how Jesus Christ punished those powers of darkness. You understand? But then he went over and said to Abraham, I don't think he had to say something because Abraham had already seen Jesus several times. He didn't have to introduce himself to Moses. Moses, he knew him very well. He didn't have to introduce himself to David. David's going crazy. Moses is going crazy. Elijah's going crazy. All the people are going crazy. And you know what happens next? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. This is what happens next. But to each of us is given grace as Christ apportions it. as why it says, when he ascended on high, he took captives and gave gifts to people. And then it talks about the gifts he gave were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The first thing he did is he got those guys out. Can you imagine? It says he carried them in his train. And each of them been given grace. He took many captives gave gifts to men. Doesn't it say he carried them in his train? He descended on high. Is that, the, is that it? Is that verse 8? Okay. And when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to men. Usually it says that he, they followed him. Can you imagine when Jesus now is being raised from the dead, the powers of darkness are broken off of him? He goes and gets Abraham and all these guys. It had to be the most shouting group of people you can ever imagine. I mean, you know, Job said, I know I'd see my redeemer, you know. But all these guys, they were going bonkers, friends. Because, are you ready? They didn't have the flesh, the human mind that blinds us to the truths of God. They'd been down there a long time. They had been promised. Abraham said he's coming. All the prophets said he's coming. But when he came, oh, holy day. By the way, somewhere along the road, over 45 years ago, Edwin Hawkins, you ever hear this? Oh, happy day. You ever hear that song? Yeah. Well, we're going to sing it again, okay? <laughs> okay, I, I want you just to stand with me. I've given you enough. Amen.